Dr. Sidrewi completed an MD program from Dalhousie University in Canada, a Master of Science in Experimental Surgery from McGill University in Canada also, a Master in Health Administration from the University of Illinois and Chicago. Um, he's also a certified physician executive. His academic clinical appointments uh, include academic slash clinical appointments include serving as an assistant professor of surgery at Northwestern University, an associate professor of surgery with tenure at the University of Illinois, the medical director uh, for um, cardiothoracic, I think, surgery, and vice chairman of Department of Surgery, Quality and Education at Tenet Healthcare Waste Hospital. Uh, is also an associate professor of surgery and health administration at Dalhousie University currently. He is serving as uh, the head uh, for the division of cardiac uh, surgery at Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, his fellowships include uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of Canada in cardiac surgery, uh, an advanced fellowship in heart and lung transplantation as well as mechanical circulatory support for from Standard University and the American Association from Physician Leadership. Dr. Sudrewi Eddy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karam. Thank you for the invitation again. It's a pleasure to be back with uh, St. George University of Beirut uh, for this lecture series. The talk is really about artificial intelligence and its impact on healthcare. I have uh, nothing relevant to disclose for the purposes of this conversation. We'll briefly go over what exactly is artificial intelligence or AI. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about how AI applies to healthcare and what we've seen already come to fruition in healthcare. And then to wrap up, we'll go through some of the workforce implications for AI. And then finally talk about the ethical issues surrounding artificial intelligence and what has already come up in healthcare ethically and where we see it going in the future, that may be of consideration. When people ask about artificial intelligence, it, it's hard to remind them, but the reality is it's not just one technology, but it's really a collection of technologies. It's a collection of processes. It's a collection of tasks, all of them that come together to support healthcare delivery. And it could be anywhere from something electronic to something digital to something mechanical to something process related or system related but all of these come together and form artificial intelligence and it really is what used to be thought of as a futuristic reality the reality is it's actually today's reality it's no longer something we're going to see in the future we're already seeing it today and we're seeing its impact today when i think of ai i really think of five components that are relevant to healthcare. Uh, the first is machine learning. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The second is natural language processing. The third, which physicians have a hard time absorbing is rule-based expert systems. The fourth is physical robots, robots that we've already seen and use in practice and clinically today. And the fifth domain of artificial intelligence that we see in healthcare is what's called robotic process automation. And that's kind of what people have traditionally thought of as AI, but now it's gone to a whole different level. But we'll go through all five of these and we'll start first with machine learning. You know, machine learning, I asked one of our uh, engineers about it and he told me flat out, you're training a model over a set of data. So the reality is you have a set of data, you create an algorithm or a model to learn about this data. And once this model, this algorithm has learned about your data set, it starts to look for trends and attributes and characteristics in the data set, and it starts to reason with it. This is the artificial intelligence reasoning with your own data set. And then it will make predictions about future data sets. That's the summary of, of machine learning. It's basically a statistical technique to fit models to data and then the model learns from the data set and trains itself to do more. We first started doing this in 2018. There's very different types of machine learnings that we can talk about, but the reality is machine learning is here. 
Deloitte did a survey about 1,100 healthcare institutions, over 60% had already employed machine learning in their businesses. So machine learning, which I consider the fundamental of AI, fundamental foundation of AI, that's what it's all about. And just to clarify it, you start with a learning algorithm. The algorithm looks for patterns in the data set we give them. The algorithm identifies attributes, or in my case, patient characteristics. Then this learning algorithm all of a sudden outputs a learning model and that model compares the patterns in the data. So we take the data set, I'll give you an example, patient characteristics, demographics. The algorithm learns from those demographics and starts to predict. This was the beginning of what we call precision medicine. And in healthcare, that's the most common form of machine learning. So in precision medicine, we predict what treatments protocols are likely to succeed based on the patient's characteristics. And how do we predict it? Based on previous data sets with characteristics. So the fundamental issue with machine learning is looking at the data set, identifying the characteristics or the attributes, looking for trends, the model learns from it, and then starts predicting the next data set or the next model. It really is an interactive process. I wish I could tell you I understand all the learning algorithms of uh, machine learning. I don't. The two I'm most familiar with are the K nearest neighbors and the decision tree algorithms. The reason why I'm familiar with them is because they're very useful in healthcare, especially in my field in cardiovascular health and cardiac surgery, especially. But of the of the whole concept of AI, machine learning is truly the fundamental basis. And machine learning is taking it from a regular EMR, a regular automated computer-based process to something that's really starting to think on its own. So I would encourage you, if you do want to look at AI in the future or AI in healthcare, machine-based learning is really the fundamental. The second aspect of AI that we interact with in healthcare is natural language processing. And it's no secret, making sense of human language has been a, a goal of AI since the early 60s. And if you look at traditional AI methodology and processes, really natural language processing was the basis. And this field really includes applications that look at speech, rec speech recognition, text analysis, translation, anything related to language or understanding language better is what NLP or natural language processing is all about. There's really two basic approaches to it. There's a statistical approach and a semantic approach. The statistical mm -hmm. approach is really based on machine learning. And basically it's learning deep learning neural networks in particular, and it's continued, it's contributed to a recent increase in the accuracy of recognition. The more we use this, the more we can recognize natural language better. But it does require, like in machine learning, a large body of language to learn from. So again, we have a huge data set, which is language in this case on the statistical side and semantic side that we use to build from. It is the dominant application in healthcare for natural language processing to use the semantic version. It helps us understand and classify clinical documentations. It helps us take unstructured clinical notes and literally feed them into domains that can further be analyzed and of course learned from in the machine learning realm. Classic example here is radiology exams. Radiologists will report things, they'll use certain words. Natural languaging processing can identify those words and build from there based on what the algorithm tells it to do. You can actually transcribe patient interactions. You can actually start having conversations through machine learning with natural language processing. So the two of these interact with each other and they're really complementary. The third one is rule-based expert systems. And this is the one that a lot of physicians have problems with. You know, at the end of the day, in the 80s, we basically had if and then rules. If and then rules were, well, if this happened here, then you do that. If that happens there, then do something else. We lived our whole 80s and 90s in healthcare as physicians studying and learning. If this, then that. The reality is healthcare is a lot more complex and we need more than just if and then rules. So what we've done is we brought human experts together with knowledge engineers and they're able to construct rules in any particular knowledge domain we want that could handle the complexities that really if then rules could not handle. So basically if then rules will work well up to a certain point, but when the rules are large, when there's lots of conflict, rules conflict with each other, 
you need a much more complex system. And that's really where AI came in. And as the knowledge domains change, as the rules change, it became more time consuming. AI through machine learning algorithms and natural process, natural language processing was able to overcome this. And that's why now we have the machine learning algorithms in the middle of language processing used to make decisions. So you saw how I went from machine-based learning with the help of understanding the language. Now we're into expert systems being developed, not just simple dichotomy, yes, no, if then, a really complex system decision-making is coming in. The fourth example of AI in healthcare is something that a lot of people have always thought of for a while, which is really physical robots. You know, it's, it's no secret. There's over 200,000 industrial robots every year installed around the world. And they do everything from lifting, repositioning, welding, assembling, they work in warehouses and factories. It's unbelievable, even hospitals, we have robots doing physical activities. But most recently, robots have become more collaborative with humans. And the reason why is they're more easily trained. We've now introduced AI capabilities into the brains of these robots. And by doing this, sorry there, and by doing this, we've been able to expand what we can do with the robots. So they're actually able to do more intelligent activities than what they could do in the past. Their brains or their operating systems are being upgraded machine learning is brought into there and they're able to start learning from the data around them. And there's no doubt that we will incorporate this automation even more. On the surgical side, we had robots approved in the United States in the year 2000 and robots have given us surgeons great ability to see. We see things we've never seen before anatomically. We're much more precise. We can even stitch with the help of the robot. All of this is being done deep, pelvic based surgery. So gynecology, urology is very heavily now dependent on robotic surgery and even head and neck surgery areas in the head and neck that we couldn't access before because of our own hands and instruments limitations, we're not able to access with the robot. So there's no, no doubt the presence of physical robots has enhanced our surgical experience and added a whole lot more. This is the classic example of the Da Vinci robot from Intuitive that we're uh, using uh, almost on a daily basis. And obviously it looks like a complete mess in the operating room when you have a robot there covered with, with bags and sterile uh, equipment. But the reality is it does help us see a lot more, do a lot better. In cardiac surgery, in my field, we use it to harvest the mammary artery. We use it to do valve repairs. We use it to do coronary bypass surgery. There's no doubt the robot is here to stay and there is a niche where it does play a great, great role. The final aspect of AI that I want to talk about before we get into the actual applications is robotic process automation. And this really is what people have always thought AI was in the past. So this technology basically performs structured digital, digital tasks for administrative purposes. So those evolving information system, this is where AI and informatics comes in. It's as if it was a human following scripts or rules and the robotically going through process issues. So compared to other forms of AI, this is the least expensive, this is the easiest to program, and this is the most transparent form of AI. It's literally you telling a data, a, an informaticist, this is what to do, this is how to do it, please follow these rules. So robotic process automation doesn't actually involve robots, it's really a bunch of programs on servers, but it does rely on a combination of workflow and business rules or presentation layer integration is what it's called with information systems to act like sort of a semi-intelligent system. In healthcare, we use this mostly for prior authorizations to update patient records and billing. We use it to extract data even from diagnostic systems to input into transactional systems. So this is where machine learning comes in. We take the diagnoses that the radiologist dictated or the pathologist dictated on the reports. We put it into a transactional system where we say, oh, look, we found a breast lump, call the surgical oncologist. We found a lung mass, call the thoracic surgeon. So with AI based brains, machine learning based brains now incorporated into the system, even the robotic process automation has gone to the next level. It's not just about filing reports, it's actually filing the report, thinking about it and going to the next level. So those are the five components of AI that I kind of think of when it comes time to looking how AI has impacted healthcare. Now let's kind of take it to application, talk about some applications and of AI that we have already seen in healthcare that are already out there. You know, on this slide, it's a 
little diagram of the four main components. So we have an impact on patient care from the patient's perspective and the health system's perspective. We have an impact on medical imaging and diagnosis or the workup of patient care. We have an impact on management. And this is where insurance companies, governments, hospital systems want to be involved. And then the fourth aspect, and this is the one I love the most, is the research and development side where AI has helped us traditionally in drug discovery and gene analysis, but now more importantly in devices, how devices impact humans. And, you know, my, my son is a big Iron Man fan. He always asks me about the nice shiny heart in the middle of Iron Man. I tell him that's an artificial heart. One day we'll all have one. Even artificial hearts are getting more AI built into them. And I'll show you a picture of some of them. The reality is AI has affected absolutely everything in healthcare. And none of, none of what I'm about to show you is futuristic. This is stuff we're already doing right now. And it's already been in practice, some of it for almost five years. The first is the patient care experience. You know, from the health system perspective, and this is the system looking to the patient, we have seen a huge component of AI change. And the reality is, this is here to stay. The classic example, the first example we've had is IBM's Watson. So Watson, as you know, is a precision medicine component. It is focused literally almost exclusively on cancer diagnosis and treatment. It's had a lot of attention in the media because it's particular attention to cancer. Watson itself is a combination of machine learning and natural language processing capabilities. You know, the early enthusiasm for Watson kind of faded a bit because patients kind of realized they don't want to talk to a machine. They want to talk to a doctor. That's a whole other thing we'll talk about later. The reality is Watson kind of struggled with the complexity of cancer. It's actually not a single product, but it's really a set of cognitive services. And the purpose of these services through what's called application programming interfaces, it's really there to interpret cancer data, interpret patient characteristics and match them together. So there's a speech and language component to it. There's a vision component to it. But the biggest value of Watson was really the machine learning based data analysis, taking all this tremendous amount of tremendous amounts of data from clinicians, from patients, looking at those data sets, identifying the characteristics, the trends, the attributes, analyzing them, and eventually give a plan, give a prognosis, predict a clinical course, and ideally offer a treatment plan. Watson has huge potential. I don't want to talk too about too many different brands, but it has a huge potential. I'm pretty sure it's going to be here to stay. But the biggest thing we learned from Watson was machine learning was not enough. Natural language processing was not enough. That human component still has to be there. But on the data analysis side, there's no doubt the, the benefit was tremendous. In my field, in cardiovascular healthcare, We've learned, we've used machine learning and algorithms quite a bit. And this is just a very simple decision tree diagram that I pulled up that really helps us look at survival after cardiac surgery. Just a simple questions, yes and no, or different categories. As I said before, in the eighties, everything was if and then. If you're over in 70, then this is what's happened. If you're a diabetic, this is what happens. If you're this, if you're that. As these complexities got much more complex, we moved towards these decision trees. If you're over 70 and your ejection fraction is below 30, here's your chance of mortality. If you're over 70 and you're a diabetic, here's your chance of mortality. If you're a diabetic with a higher EF or a lower EF, if you have a higher chance of dialysis or not, you can see it was no longer just an if then analysis. It became much more difficult. That's why machine learning has helped us with this. If you look at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons database, there's over 250 parameters in there. We can pretty much predict for you your average length of stay, your chance of morbidity or mortality, your chance of dialysis, your chance of long intubation, all from the database. We take the last data attributes of the previous 100,000 patients, we look at yours, and we can connect the two and give a prediction. Kind of like what Watson does for cancer, we can do that in cardiac surgery. These are just some applications of machine learning that we've used in cardiovascular health. On the left here, the automated imaging interpretation has already been there for years. Ever since I was a medical student in the 90s, I see an EKG interpretation on top of every EKG. I don't look at the EKG interpretation, but guess what? The computer interprets it. 
I talk to my cardiologist, I read it myself. But we have detection of arrhythmias. We have cardiac cats that can be read now. We can even read echoes. When we look at the ejection fraction, how much blood is pumped out of someone's heart, we can visually look at it ourselves. Or guess what? The computer can tell us. Machine learning has built in to watch a moving heart and tell us how much blood is being ejected. All of that is on the imaging interpretation side. The natural language processing benefits, we identify patients with different heart failure diagnostic criteria and understand how to treat them. Look at atrial fibrillation and arrhythmias and understand how to treat them. But the biggest value of AI in cardiovascular health has really been in the predictive analytics. If someone who's going to have bleeding after a coronary intervention, who's going to have kidney injury after cardiac surgery, who's going to have a possible mortality from an open heart operation. The predictive analytics of AI have increased so much from the old days of if and then to the expert models we have now. It is very predictive. The positive predictive value is quite, quite high. So not just in cancer with IBM Watson, even in cardiovascular health, AI has had a huge impact already. As well from the health system side, AI has helped the technology, the devices that we put in. On the screen here on the left, you can see one of the original pacemakers. It was a box about this big. They used to sit in the upper abdomen. It was actually a procedure to do a pacemaker. It was like a big deal. Oh, someone's getting a pacemaker. We've come a long way from the 50s. What used to be 73 grams went down to 50 to 10 to 20. Now we have pacemakers that are only about two grams in weight and about one cc in size. They've literally gotten that small. Those are loop recorders where we can actually interrogate people's arrhythmias. Most pacemakers I put in are about this big. So almost as thin as a credit card. And they've gotten smaller, they've gotten smarter. Pacemakers in the past just paced. Now pacemakers won't just pace, they'll respond to you. If you're running, if you're jogging, if your body temperature goes up, if you're having sex, whatever you're doing, the pacemaker can respond to that and pace faster. They can also respond and pace slower at nighttime when you're asleep. When the pacemakers reach end of life, when the battery needs to be changed, the pacemaker sends us an email and tells us this patient needs to have their battery changed. Artificial intelligence is already in pacemaker technology, and this is already seven, eight years ago. You no longer need the physician to go interrogate the pacemaker. The pacemaker interrogates itself and sends us an email. Who knows what it will do next? But the reality is, this is how AI has impacted technology from a device standpoint in the arrhythmia world. In my world, AI has had an even bigger impact. So this is a Thoratec artificial heart on the left that you see here. It's literally a pump. You see those big tubes on the left? One's going into the patient, one's coming out of the patient. That is your classic old school left ventricular assist device. The patient, it sat on the patient's belly, it sat outside their body, it could never fit inside, it was so big. That's the best technology we had back in the 90s. Even worse than that, on the right, you see an image of what looks like a refrigerator. That's not a refrigerator, that's actually the console, the machine running the artificial heart. So every patient that had this artificial heart had to stay in the hospital, could barely move out of bed, could not do anything to help themselves get better before they have their next operation, which would have been a heart transplant. That's the best technology we had in the 90s. An artificial heart that sat outside the body and you connected to a refrigerator in a hospital. Nowadays, we don't do any of this. Nowadays, on the left, you see the artificial hearts that we put in now fit inside the patient's pericardium. They literally fit inside the body. It's the same incision I do for open heart surgery. I just make it two centimeters longer, the stuff in the artificial heart. You can see the x-ray image, the artificial heart is inside the body. It's draining blood from the left ventricle, goes through the pump and goes into the aorta. All of this is inside the body. The only piece of machinery outside the body is the little power cord you see on the left side of the patient's abdomen. That's it. You can see the image on the right. Here's a patient with a artificial heart. She's strapped to her battery pack and the power cord is plugged inside. At nighttime, she goes home, she plugs herself in at nighttime. The same impact AI had on pacemakers, it's having on heart failure, which is my field. The devices are smaller, they're smarter, they're rate responsive. 
and there's no more huge issue with power. In fact, we're now in the final stages of clinical trials to have the power, the energy source for these artificial hearts be transcutaneous. The same way you charge your iPhone by putting it on a pad to charge, one day they'll just put a pad on their skin and they'll charge an artificial heart. So the reality is AI has helped these devices become smarter. It's helped us from a technology development standpoint. The devices are smaller, they're, they weigh less, they're easier to put in. One day this will even become a long-term durable procedure. The, long, the longest person I've had on artificial heart now is about seven years. I have colleagues that have almost hit 10 years with their patients on artificial hearts. So the impact AI has had on these devices is tremendous. These little controllers here you see wrapped around her waist, that is the battery pack and the AI brains of the device. The device responds. If she goes jogging, the device pumps blood faster. When she slows down, the device slows down. They truly are rate responsive and responsive to the patient's needs, which is what we want in the end. Not just improve quantity of life, but improve quality of life. What about from the patient standpoint? You know, the patients love AI more than we do. And any of you that own an Apple Watch, a smartwatch, a Fitbit, you guys know this better than I do. At the end of the day, you know, one of the biggest problems we've had in healthcare is patient engagement and adherence, especially in the area of chronic diseases. You know, the final barrier we need to overcome to get good outcomes is really patient compliance. And AI has helped us. You know, the more patients proactively participate in their own healthcare, the better the outcomes. And by participate and better outcomes, I mean from a utilization standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from a patient experience standpoint, all these factors are being addressed by big data. All these are being addressed by AI. The biggest one is actually compliance. You know, how to improve patient compliance for chronic diseases, diabetes, obesity, all these things is huge. It'll reduce so much cost to the system if we can adjust patient mm -hmm. behavior just a little bit to comply with weight loss, scheduling follow-up visits, filling prescriptions, complying with any treatment plan in diabetics and endocrine issues. At the end of the day, we know AI-based capabilities can help us in personalizing care, contextualizing care, and making improving compliance with care. So there's a growing emphasis on machine learning and business rule engagement to help us drive these behavioral changes. And these are what's called conversational interfaces, interfaces between the AI, whatever that device or technology is, and the patient. On the pacemaker side, it was easy. The pacemaker emails me, the surgeon, and I call the patient in to change his battery. The patient doesn't have to get involved. On the heart failure side, they have an artificial heart, they plug themselves in, minimal involvement. But on this side here, the patient is very heavily involved, especially in the chronic disease standpoint. So the more messaging alerts, the more relevant targeted evidence-based data the patients can get, the more we can increase their awareness, the more they're gonna be involved. So from a patient compliance standpoint, this is a huge, huge impact. And I'm sure more than half of you have Apple iWatches and smartwatches and smartphones and all these things. The data sets now are integrated into the electronic health records. Your biosensor, your watch, your smartphone, we can even integrate that with the EHR. The point I'm getting out with this slide is at the end of the day, the patients are getting more involved in their own care. And that's really thanks to AI. And we, we can't deny that. We truly can't deny that. So it's been, it's been a pleasure seeing this. As a cardiac surgeon, it's been a pleasure seeing this. And I incorporate this quite a bit in my practice. This is a system we're starting to use here called the Seamless MD. And it's Apple, it's, it can be Apple or Android based. It's a phenomenal system. It, it puts the digital care plan at the hand of the patient. We can monitor them remotely. There's a dashboard that I get to see from all the patients as well as analytics. It's compliant with all privacy laws and it's integrated fully into our electronic medical record. The beauty of this is the patient's data comes up on their screen. I get notified, they get notified. They get automatic feedback right there from the device. And it can customize their plan. And me as a clinician, I can weigh into customizing the plan. So I can't tell you the huge amount of benefit this has for the patient. And obviously for me, this saves me a lot of phone calls, a lot of visit, clinic visits that would not be necessary, especially if patients live far away. And it puts all of this at their fingertips. So the amount of integration, the machine-based learning that's involved in these programs is tremendous. This isn't just virtual care or EHR, electronic medical record assisted care. 
there's actual machine learning built into here. The algorithm analyzes the patient's data, compares it to other patients' data, and gives us a recommendation. It sees what I recommend and even learns from what I recommend to recommend next time. Very advanced systems. On the administration and management side, this is where governments have gotten involved tremendously and they, they see a huge benefit in this. You know, the average nurse in the United States spends 25% of their time on regulatory issues or administrative activities. And with robotic process automation, really this is, this is the technology most relevant to this. It's used for a wide variety of applications in healthcare, like not just claims processing and clinical documentation, but revenue cycle management, medical record management, it's been a huge benefit. And, you know, what, what's happened here is it's saved lots of money. It's improved staff satisfaction. It's helped make care more efficient and a lot of situations more safe. Insurers use this to make sure the claims are correct. So government sponsored health insurance, so Medicare, Medicaid in the States, the provincial health care is in Canada or in Europe. Government sponsored insurers love this to make sure, but the beauty of it isn't just taking a claim and making sure it's right. The beauty of AI here has been bringing machine learning into this. It saves the governments, it saves the insurers time, it saves them money, it saves them effort, but also we learn from it. When similar claims come in, we can learn how to process them faster, more efficiently, we learn how to reduce errors. So the automation here isn't just robotic process automation, it's bringing machine learning into it. That's why I always say machine learning and understanding algorithms and how the algorithms learn from each other, that's the fundamental basis of AI. In the management side, it has saved governments tremendous amounts of money and they, they absolutely love it and it's not going away. It's been here for years and it's only gonna improve even more. The final aspect of AI and how it's been applied to healthcare, and this is my favorite part of it, has really been in research and development. It's helped us print out models through 3D printing. It's helped us simulate scenarios through augmented reality and now it's called hyper-realistic visualization. It's helped us train surgical residents. It's really helped in every aspect of helping the patient and the learner understand healthcare and what it's delivering. And as a surgeon, that's very important for me and for my practice. The classic example is 3D printing and none of this, none of this will be new to, to you, but at, at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, 3D printing starts with imaging acquisitions. So on the left of the screen, you see our traditional stuff, a traditional CAT scan, a traditional MRI, the heart. You even see 3D echoes and 3D images. And in this case, they're focusing on the mitral valve. So this is our traditional imaging process. We take this through DICOM, through what's called digital imaging and communication and medicine, through DICOM images. We export them to start processing the images. And the purpose of this processing is to do what's called segmentation and volume rendering. And we generate what's called a, stereo, a stereolithography file, the STL file. And the purpose of the segmentation and volume rendering is to take all these CT scans and MRIs, which are two-dimensional reconstructs of a three-dimensional image. We take them and we go from the 2D back to the 3D. And we do this with segmentation, with volume rendering to generate these STL files. Because the STL files eventually, once the STL file is done, you can see here the mitral valve on the right, it's imported into a computer to start designing. And you can see down here on the right, the computer aided decision modeling, the STL file gets incorporated into this model. We further smoothen it out, we trim it, we color it out, we color code it, we dissect it out. Then finally, after all this is done, we take it, we export it for printing. And when it's time for printing, you know, the printer materials are selected. So is it silicone? What type of material is used? And it's based really on the desired quality and mechanical parameters we want. And obviously the cost of printing this is a cost to all this. But we went from that traditional 2D, 2D image of a CAT scan to a volume rendered image, to an STL file, to our computer reconstruction. Now here we are printing. And the material can be pretty much anything we want. You can see here on the left, we have a 3D image of a mitral valve and a 3D image printed image of a whole heart. The purpose here is we took those images that only the clinicians understood, the cardiologist or the cardiac surgeon. Now we've made it into a 3D structure everyone can understand. Everyone can look at and feel and touch. 
the amount of understanding we get from this is tremendous, but the amount of learning and simulation we can do is, is just as important. You can see here a 3D printed image of a left atrium showing us the pulmonary veins and the left atrial appendage. So the amount of understanding increased tremendously when we showed this to our learners. The early operator learning curves, which we studied, were significantly reduced by having a pre-procedural 3D image that the learner could look at and understand. This allowed learners to look at that left atrial appendage before they went after it and understood its unique sizing, its angular, how it lands, how the left atrial appendage, the LA is related to the left atrium. So you can see here two different models of left atrial appendages. The learner got to see both of them. They could understand how those left atrial appendages related to other structures in the heart. So the amount of learning we get from 3D printing is tremendous. And that model that I showed you earlier is really how we go from the 2D CAT scan and echo to the 3D printed model. You know, moving forward, we use this also for 3D printed simulation. And this is for different levels of surgical training. So if you look at the bottom left, you see a 3D printed high-end simulation of a valve. And that's fine, it helps us train dexterity, it trains, shows the surgery, go resident, how to handle instruments and stuff. But when you tell them it's the actual patient's valve that they're gonna do the next day, it gets a little different. The trainees get a little bit more excited. They can actually practice repair techniques on that standard valve model. In fact, and you can see in image number three, they can rehearse on the patient's specific valve. We can tell them, this is the valve you're gonna to repair tomorrow in this patient. They can have a crack at it literally the day before they go. But you'll notice when you look at this image, image three, there's the ring there that they put in. And you can see the instruments and the surgical resident training on the model. But it looks just like a silicone model and it looks artificial. It doesn't look like a patient's model. So how do you go from simulation to making it look real? That's what we call hyperrealism. And hyperrealism is when AI comes in to help us with simulation. So if you look at the bottom right here, you see the silicone 3D printed model. It's a white silicone based product. The simulator looks at the mitral valve of the silicone replica, that's it. But when deep learning comes in, when deep neural network comes in, when we show the machine, the actual mitral valve, when we tell them apply it to the silicone model, you know, it's called a hyper-realistic visualization, which is really a subform of augmented reality where artificial looking objects, this artificial silicone 3D printed mitral valve now starts to look real. It looks as if there's texture there. We can even add blood in there. We can even make it look so real, you wouldn't know the difference. Objects already look realistic and ideal when you're looking through this. So from the learner standpoint, they're now looking at a real model. If you take it one step further, on the left, you see the 3D echo that becomes a 3D valve all through imaging, through 3D printing, we can simulate an actual silicone replica. Guess what happens to this replica? We make it hyper-realistic. It looks like the image on the bottom right. It looks almost like real tissue. So when you apply 3D imaging acquisition to virtual imaging hyper-realism, it almost looks real. And I think the best image I've ever seen of this that I've been able to use in my practice is this next shot here. And you can see here on the top, that's the simulator. If you were to look at the simulator through regular eyes, that's all you would see. A mitral valve, a white silicone replica, and the trainee goes in and practices suturing. But we can transform that simulator to look hyper-realistic. And those images you see up top, those are the exact same images on the bottom, only with AI hyper-realism introduced. So the amount of AI, the amount that AI has helped us on the training standpoint, on the simulation standpoint is beyond beyond real. It's helped the trainees almost feel like they're in the operating room. In fact, if you look at this and I just add in the back the sound of a monitor, it would be no different than you being in the operating room. The only difference is they're operating on a silicone mitral valve as opposed to a real human's valve. But the con context, the simulation, the environment that the trainee is in is identical to the operating room. You're, you would not know the difference if I were to show you me in the OR versus this. It looks almost identically the same. That's where B AI has helped us on the simulation side. Truly on the research and development side, it's unreal what, uh, how much it's been able to help us. 
Well, now that you've seen the impact AI has had on healthcare, we first understood what AI was in the five domains of AI. Then I've shown you some real applications that are already in place today for AI. What does this mean for the workforce? And more importantly, like any technology you introduce, we don't like to talk about it, but there is an ethical domain here that, that we have to, an ethical dimension we have to acknowledge. And uh, it gets very tricky with AI, very tricky. On the workforce side, people come up to me all the time and ask, am I gonna lose my job one day because the robot took it? Am I gonna lose my job one day because a computer is reading our slides and reading our x-rays? You know, Deloitte, with the help of the Oxford Martin Institute, back in 2015, looked at this. And they predicted that a third of all jobs in the UK will be gone in 10 to 20 years because of AI. That was their prediction, 35%. Well, luckily in 2020, they redid the study and realized the actual job loss was about 5%. And the reason why, and they looked into this, first of all, was the cost of these technologies is quite prohibitive. But number two, the labor market kept growing. The demand kept growing. AI couldn't even accommodate for that demand in the labor market. And the cost benefits of automation really was more on the cost side than the benefit side, especially for simple labor issues. And then finally, regulatory wise, they didn't know what to do with AI. And socially, a lot of AI endeavors and tasks were not accepted socially. And that's an interesting thing to bring up because what do you mean socially you won't accept a robot? Well, do you really want to hear from Watson that you have cancer? You'd rather not. You want to hear from your physician, your nurse that you have cancer, someone with some empathy. So the reality is, you know, socially, AI has not been as accepted as we thought, and even regulatory wise. There are various niches where it has been. Look at the smartwatch market, it's booming, but in other areas, it's not. So what was predicted as a 30% job loss or 35%? ended up only being 5%, but what's important is study why we didn't lose jobs like we did. My colleagues in radiology and pathology and dermatology seem to be scared the most. And we, we talk about this quite a bit at our meetings. And you know the reality is as a radiologist or a pathologist, you do a lot more than just read slides. You do more than just read and interpret slides. You know, like other AI systems, radiology AI systems, even though today they'll interpret this X-ray or the CAT scan, but that's all they do. But it's really been the deep learning models in the labs and the startups that are trained for specific images that have had an impact. So if you machine learn a program to look at a breast mass and the breast mass looks suspicious, then the algorithm can know what to do with the breast mass and who to refer it to. But that's still a big step. So radiologists don't just read, they consult. For us to get to that level of deep learning algorithms for image recognition, you know, the, the algorithm has to learn from a data set. So you have to, the algorithm has to see millions of breast lumps or millions of breast masses to understand what the breast mass is, which one needs to be further followed up. We don't have that aggregated repository yet of all these images. One day we will, but we don't have it yet. The next step is the image analysis and recognition, you know, how do you regulate that? And this is where regulation comes in quite a bit. We're not sure how to regulate it. And more importantly, how are insurance companies gonna deal with this? I mean, at the end of the day, these are still clinical processes and AI-based image work is there to help interpret an image, but it's not there to follow up on it. It's not there to act on the next step. We're at the image analysis stage. We're not at the transactional stage yet of machine-based learning. We will get there one day, but we're not quite there yet. So the radiologists and pathologists among you, you still have job security for at least a couple of decades, I presume, but who knows how good or how fast the technology will come. So I said earlier, you know, ethics is probably the most difficult issue to address here because number one, you know, the four premises, so accountability, transparency, and permission and patient privacy, we don't have algorithms for that. You know, we have a deep learning algorithm for image analysis, but how do you interpret this to other people? Let's say someone says to you, I'd like to understand this algorithm, doctor, can you explain this to me? Most physicians, including me, we don't understand the details of how the algorithm reached the diagnosis of cancer on this image. It's actually impossible for us to explain this to most people, let alone to my colleagues. 
So the transparency side is hard. You have to have an algorithm that's fully transparent for everything. And then on the accountability side, even AI systems will make mistakes. So who's accountable for that mistake? The person that wrote the algorithm? Are you the most responsible physician overseeing the case? Who is responsible? So transparency is an issue, accountability is an issue. Then finally, what about privacy? So it's great for you to have your own watch and AI feeds back to you, but what if someone hacks into that? What if someone's, your information goes somewhere else? And then when you do get a diagnosis from your watch or somewhere else, do you really wanna hear from the watch or do you wanna hear from the other stakeholders or a clinician? So at the end of the day, privacy is an issue, permission is an issue, transparency is an issue and accountability is an issue. These are the ethical issues surrounding this repository of data that an algorithm is learning from and then making recommendations for you. At the end of the day, and this is something we also found interesting when we looked at ethics and AI, even machine learning is not free of bias. There is algorithmic bias, algorithmic bias based on gender, based on race. Does every person of a certain racial background get hypertension? Does every person of one gender get this illness or that illness? There's biological reasons, but is there true gender-based reasons you know, even algorithms are at risk of bias. So at the end of the day, I will caution you that AI is not the end result or the end of everything we want. We still have to have oversight. We still have to ask ourselves, you know, how good is this algorithm? How transparent are we with our patients and our decision-making? Who's held accountable? And, and more importantly, I don't think we're gonna be replacing humans with AI at the end of the day, not today or tomorrow, or even in 10 or 15 years. There's no doubt it has an impact. I am hope today in the last half hour, 40 minutes, I showed you the impact. More importantly, we have to understand how the applications apply, what the impact is, and more importantly, what it means for us, the consumer at the end of the day. The consumer meaning the patient first and foremost, but also the clinicians and obviously the healthcare systems. So on that note, I wanna say thank you. I wanna thank uh, Marcel Karam once again for the invitation to uh, to give you this lecture series. I think this is the last one of your year. So I hope, wish everyone had a good year and hope you'll have a great summer. I'll be happy to entertain uh, any questions uh, you guys have.